Okay. Good morning, everybody, and thank you. And I think it's uh, um, notable that we have a, a lot of people here today, and all of our speakers are here on time. I think that speaks to the importance and the investment in this issue. Um, this is going to be a continuation of a conversation we've been having for years now in California. Uh, and I think this year is the year that we're really going to get it done because as you see behind me, we have a coalition of family members, we have a, a coalition of mayors, of psychiatrists, and bipartisan groups of legislators who are invested in finally uh, reforming um, the ability to conserve people who are in desperate need of help on our streets and in, in our communities. Uh, and of course we're talking about the LPS or the Lanham and Petrus Short Act of 1967. Um, and I talk about that act, 1967, as we all know it's 2023 now. Uh, so decades have passed uh, and we're still operating on laws that were a good idea at one point in our, in our history and have now become obsolete and, and a barrier to care versus a protection for people. Um, and last year, as you know, we did uh, Care Court, um, which was successful and going towards implementation right now. And we knew at that time that that was a, a part of redoing our entire services, but we also knew that our entire including um, the conservatorship act at the end uh, because we know if people aren't successful in the care court then they go back to our regular system and if we continue to have the gaping holes that we've historically had since 1967 then people will continue just to um, linger in the streets um, and continue to get to get worse so this year first I'll note that we are introducing uh, SB 363, which is part of this package, which is uh, a bed registry, or to be able to have, and people may be surprised that right now, like an on-time, online, you cannot find out where there's an open psychiatric bed, substance abuse bed, uh, throughout the continuum of care. So that this year is also the year we hope to be successful in doing this. Um, we'll begin to implement those across the country. It makes no sense for mental health professionals to be on the phone with a notebook calling places to see if there's a bed for somebody in desperate need of beds. Um, also this year, SB or Senate Bill 43 will include, when we talk about gravely disabled, will include individuals with a mental health substance abuse disorder that results in the risk and evidence of substantial uh, serious harm. That means that people who are experiencing significant deterioration um, or illness due to their inability to meet their basic needs, that we will be able to intervene uh, with them. Um, the bill will also ensure that relevant medical history, so if someone's had a history of doing this, they can't come in and just at that one point in time and be able to say, uh, I've got a plan for the rest of the day, when we know that that has happened time and time and time again. And of course, just always to say that people's rights are foremost foremost in protecting, that we know that that people will continue to have uh, the representation that they need. Um, but we really feel like this is a necessary step, uh, and you'll hear from families and from psychiatrists who have been working in the space for so long. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Jessica Cruz, who is the executive director of NAMI California. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. My name is Jessica Cruz. I'm the CEO of NAMI California. We are the largest statewide mental health advocacy organization. We are also the largest in the nation as well. Um, I'm here today representing families. We represent families across California, including the patients. And so a lot of our advocacy is for things just like this. But first, I want to thank the senator for her leadership, her passion, and really her willingness to engage stakeholders in the community. She's really listened to families, been out on the ground, heard and seen firsthand what a lot of these archaic laws have been doing to people languishing on the streets, which is why at Care Court, she was such a leader there and we were able to get that passed and this is just another kind of step closer to making sure that we're updating some laws. How do you really untwine 67 years worth of a law where we have now seen over that time people not getting better, people not getting help. In fact, I'm sure a lot of you saw on your way here people sitting in their tents and you're wondering how can we solve this problem? It's the question that we're all asking. How do we solve this problem? But what you're not seeing is also those family members 
that are in the rooms with their families who are caring for them 99% of the time. For people like Teresa's family, who she has been fighting for years and years and years to get her son the treatment that he needs. So we're, we're seeing this invisible, we're not seeing this invisible population, but you are seeing it in your face right now on the streets. And that's why this law, the, uh, the LPS Gravely Disabled, is so important and why NAMI California stands in support and the bed registry is so needed. We know that California is in desperate need of beds. This will at least provide us with a little bit of insight of beds that are actually available, but a whole lot of insight into the lack that we have available within the state. So it is my pleasure to introduce Teresa Pasquini, who is a fierce activist locally, statewide, nationally. She's the co-author of a white paper called Housing That Heals. If you haven't read it, it's incredible. And she's a dear friend and a NAMI, longtime NAMI member, Teresa. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Jessica and NAMI California, for, this partner, for your partnership and this opportunity. And thank you so much, Senator Eggman, for keeping your promise to families like ours who have waited for over 55 years to see the LPS Act modernized with medical science and quality improvement standards applied to a system redesign. Um, this is another civil rights fight of our lifetime and families are ready to stand with you um, and help our loved ones live with their rights on. So I'm here today as the proud mom of an adult son who lives heroically with a severe mental illness. My beloved son was diagnosed in his teens and has spent much of his adult life locked in psychiatric health facilities in California. He's been 5150'd over 40 times, uh, deemed gravely disabled, and has remained on an LPS conservatorship for the past 21 years. Still. He has experienced every jagged edge of every broken piece of the California private and public health systems. But because of luck and heroics uh, and access to appropriate medically necessary treatment, my Danny is currently living in safety and recovery at Synergy's Nueva Vista campus in Morgan Hill in Santa Clara County. It is what I call housing that heals. And after 20 years of being failed, jailed, treated and streeted, my son is finally receiving the right care at the right time and in the right place. But that care is not available to all the families whose loved ones have developed no-fault serious brain diseases that can rob their voluntary decision-making capacity to seek safety and care to prevent grave disability. And I don't want anyone, anywhere, anytime to experience the suffering that my family and my son have experienced. So I'm here today as a representative voice of families of the most severely mentally ill population. We are partners in care who have become lifetime caregivers and curbside caregivers without adequate support. And we are terrified of dying and worry about what will happen when we're gone. So we are all shattering the silence that has shackled our loved ones, families, and communities for too long. Our voice is growing louder, stronger, and united. And we have partnered with patients for years, but we will no longer settle for the status quo that has forced too many of our loved ones to die with their rights on. Families like Mark Rippey and Maddie Delaney, two, two of many. We must all do a better job of building common ground that will offer a bed instead of a jail cell, a street corner, or a coffin. And it's time to prevent danger to self and others, not require it. It's time for a right to treatment before tragedy. It's time that we all care together. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, we're going to turn it over to uh, Mayor Todd Glory of San Diego. Thank you, Senator Eggman. And Teresa, thank you so much for your powerful activism, sharing your personal story. I will tell you that <clears throat> since I... Uh, called for conservatorship reform in my 2022 State of the City address, I've been struck by the number of families, families like yours, that have come to me and said, this is a problem that we're experiencing as well. And our 
uh, cultural uh, bias against discussing mental health uh, really prevents a lot of these families from coming forward and sharing their stories. So when you do it, when someone as recently as this past Saturday when I was talking about an unrelated matter, but a father who came up to me afterwards explaining the exact same situation where his child, adult child, has cycled in and out of jails and locked facilities and elsewhere only to continue to be frustrated. He can't get a conservatorship. Yeah. Uh, and this is a gentleman uh, with some affluence, some, some, uh, some privilege in San Diego. And his remark to me was, with all that I have going for me, and I can't get this done, what is it for the least amongst us, for families that don't have these resources, for adult folks suffering with mental illness who don't have a parent who can engage like this? What we know is what we see, what happens to those folks is all across this state, which are folks living unsheltered in extremely dangerous situations uh, where too often the end result is their death. And I think we're all here to say that we want better for this population. We want to empower families to take care of their loved ones, not to have to fight the state and the county to get this work done, but to actually put these people in a better place. And I think the average Californian says the same thing. Our current rules are absolutely do not make any sense. Right? When I'm often asked, Mayor, why aren't you doing something about this person who is screaming at the top of the lungs on the street corner? And I say, well, they're not a threat to themselves or to others. That rings hollow. And I, when I deliver that message, it doesn't feel good to me either. Right? Because I know that person is sick. I know they need help. But I know that we, our current rules sets the bar so high that we can't help that individual. And we're going to wait until they become a larger expense to the taxpayer uh, before we choose to intervene, and often it comes too late. This is why I'm passionate about this issue. This is why I'm truly grateful to Senator Eggman for her persistence on this issue. We came achingly close last year to getting the job done. But the persistence in coming back again this year and saying that we're going to get this done, that's why I chose to take a really early flight from San Diego to be here this morning uh, to convey the support of the city of San Diego and the 1.4 million people that make up the second largest city uh, in the state, as well as as the chair of our bipartisan California Big City Mayors Coalition, uh, who also stand in support of Senate Bill 43 as well as Senate Bill 363. We as mayors, uh, and you'll hear from uh, a couple of our great mayors uh, in just a moment, from Anaheim, from San Jose, and from Sa San Francisco, about how they also see this playing out in their communities. But I will share this one factoid. When I talk to my public safety response folks, our paramedics, our firefighters, our police officers, we in the city of San Diego spend over 400 service hours every day responding to behavioral health emergencies. 400 hours a day. And when you consider that you might have an emergency, whether it's criminal or medical, and you may get put on hold or it takes too long to get a response, you know that a part of that is because we're not properly caring for this population that has a chronic illness that we can try and treat in a more suitable setting. So that's a part of why I'm here. Not just because families like Teresa's do better than what we're currently giving them. Not just because San Diegans and Californians are constantly asking, why can't we do better by this population? The current answer makes no sense. But here on behalf of a community that wants better public safety responses, that want to make sure that our trained professionals are responding to where they are needed, not to the ongoing rep rep repetitious chronic mental illness that we currently have. I was a member of the state legislature for many years, or for several years, and I would observe that no piece of legislation that is old as LPS um, is not worthy of updating. Clearly it is. Even the strongest proponents recognize that California in 1967 is not California in 2023. We can do better, and I believe with Senator Eggman's strong leadership and the support of families like Teresa, organizations like NAMI, we will get this done this year. And my commitment to the people of California is that mayors of the biggest cities in this state will be there shoulder to shoulder to get this job done. This is an urgent matter. This is one of the highest priorities I can think of for the state, and it's time that we treat it that way. Let's get this done this year. There are too many families who are a tragedy away uh, from uh, not being able to benefit from this change. I think the time is now to get this job done. With that, I'm pleased to turn over the podium uh, to my colleague from the great city of San Jose, Matt Meehan. Matt? Thanks, Appreciate <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and I want to especially thank Senator Eggman for her leadership on expanding mental health care to our most vulnerable populations, and thank you to all the elected officials and community leaders standing here together today to advocate for our most vulnerable. You know, for me, this issue is personal. I have loved ones who have experienced severe mental health crises in other states, and the harsh truth is had they been in California at the time of crisis, they might not be here today, much less leading productive lives. Loving our state means challenging ourselves to make it the best it can be. And it can't be at its best when we fail to help our most vulnerable. 
California fails when a mother advocates repeatedly for her child to get the help they need to no avail. California fails when our residents end up behind bars without even being in a state of mind to determine right from wrong. California fails when a child has to bury their father because his profound mental distress keeps him from accessing the treatment he needs for a manageable disease. And California fails every day when we leave our most vulnerable to die on the streets without care. It's our responsibility to stop failing Californians. Though it may seem like common sense, finding treatment for folks with an acute mental health or substance use disorder who cannot take care of themselves and compelling them toward help is often profoundly difficult for health care providers and families. The conservatorships we're here to talk about today are a last resort. No one wants to take legal responsibility for another's well-being without compelling justification. But for those suffering on our streets with no ability to provide for themselves due to mental illness or addiction, we have a moral obligation to demand better from our system and facilitate their recovery. It's the opposite of compassion to let people live and die on our streets especially in a state with the fifth largest economy in the world. In my home county, Santa Clara County, nearly 40% of our homeless neighbors and a quarter of our jail population suffer from serious mental health challenges. Tackling mental health care reform and creating a system that allows us to help our most vulnerable neighbors will move the needle on many other issues, including homelessness and over-incarceration. There's nothing more worthwhile than standing up for our neighbors experiencing the most acute conditions who do not recognize or accept or are unable to accept help. California doesn't have to fail any longer. So I'm hoping that together with this great coalition behind me, this will be the year that we get care to our most vulnerable neighbors and solve a problem that has been decades in the making and is one that is very much within our grasp to solve. So thank you to everybody standing up here for your leadership, and I'm proud to say on behalf of the City of San Jose that we are all in to bring about this reform. Thank you. And next up, we're going to hear from the uh, Mayor of San Francisco, Mayor London Breed. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, everyone, for being here, especially this amazing coalition of people um, I can tell you that probably everyone in this room has probably a story about a friend, a relative, a loved one, a neighbor, or someone that you know that has been in crisis and you wonder, why isn't anyone doing anything? Why can't anything be done? When I was on the Board of Supervisors before I became mayor, I remember a gentleman, um, and I won't use his real name, but I'll use the name James. James was really an active member of the community and worked hard every single day in construction. And one day, uh, he was hit with some equipment that led to a traumatic brain injury. And so instantly, uh, James was hospitalized, had to go through recovery, but was never the same. And eventually, he suffered from you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, schizophrenia, and a number of other issues that continue to persist today. Now, James is a really great person and very loving and very sweet uh, when he's focused, when he's out there in the community and he's talking to people. He's homeless. Uh, he continues to struggle. But every now and then, he gets very violent. Um, and he does a number of things in the community that call for people of the community to make phone calls to the police. And the police know him because he's considered a frequent flyer. They have conversations with him. They try to get him help. He's been in and out of the shelter system. He's been arrested. He's assaulted a police officer before. And he continues to be on the streets to this very day. In fact, he's a senior. Um, every time he gets his you know, social security check and he tries to cash it, he gets robbed, his money gets taken, and the community has taken it on, on themselves to be kind of the caretakers of James. There's a place that gets his mail, sometimes people let them let him sleep in their stores, and what they've said to me time and time again, why can't we do anything? Why can't we provide support and treatment? During this process, 
in addition to him being arrested and going into the hospital and, and going through the challenges that continue to persist and trying to help this one individual, there was a time when we were going to be able to get him conserve. Uh, State Senator Scott Weiner, who's joining us here today, um, helped to push forward a conservatorship law that would have allowed us to move people like him through a conservatorship process. Uh, but unfortunately, um, when the time came in court and the person who provided the diagnosis wasn't available to give testimony and be in court, the entire case was thrown out. And why is that the case? There were community people there. There were so many advocates. People were fighting for James. He was fighting for himself, but didn't want anyone to tell him what to do or what he needed to get, have done in order to protect himself. And I think that's part of why our system is broken and part of what uh, Senator Eggman is trying to fix with these uh, collective of Senate bills that will help to change the definition so that, for example, that same clinician who diagnosed James could just provide a written detailed report that could be used to make a decision about whether or not someone like him should be conserved. It is absolutely heartbreaking and sad to think about the fact that he's still out there, he's still going through the same cycle. City resources, constant frustration uh, from the community because he's a beloved member of the community even with his problems. And the fact is the system is broken and it's not working. And why is it fair? He doesn't have anyone advocating for him other than the community. He has no family, he has no support, he has no money. And this, hopefully, will make a significant difference in changing that. The fact is, as much as we uh, talk about mental health, especially after this pandemic with everything we've gone through, when you think about many of the diseases that come into play, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and other things, dementia, Alzheimer's, this could happen to anyone at any given time. And the system as it is set up is failing people. It's failing people in crisis. And this is a part of doing something about it. So I stand here in full support of uh, SB 43 and SB 363 uh, because they are needed. Uh, the time is now. Uh, we cannot continue to wait. Uh, Care Courts has been great, uh, but at the same time we have to do more. In San Francisco, we've implemented uh, alternative because oftentimes you're calling 911 when someone's in crisis and the police show up. Well, now we have an alternative, the street crisis response team. They've responded in a year and a half to over 14,000 calls. And half of those people we've tried to get into support. And in many cases, they've had to be 5150. But then what's next? We can't force them into treatment. We can't force them into a better situation. We can't force them even sometimes into the housing that we may have available for them. And that is a tragedy, and that is something that needs to change. So my hope is that these common sense changes to an outdated law will help make a significant difference for those who are struggling in crisis whether they have an advocate or not. The time is now to make change, and I'm looking forward to seeing that change happen and making sure that we have the resources necessary to implement it so that those lives on the streets can be saved. And with that, I want to introduce the mayor from Anaheim, uh, Mayor Atkin. Thank you, Mayor Breed. Um, today we come together to advance and support California's leading role in addressing homelessness. And I want to thank my colleagues that are here today in Sacramento for their leadership um, on this issue, as well as our coalition here, and the partnership with cities like Anaheim and across our great state. And I believe that cities, and by default mayors and councils, are really on the front lines of this crisis. In Anaheim, to give you a city perspective, we're proud of the leadership that we have taken in Orange County to address this issue. Since 2017, Anaheim has opened up four shelters to serve our city, as well as expanding our flagship shelter. And as a result, since 2019, we have had our unsheltered population decline by 30%. But to assist those still living in homelessness, we respond daily with outreach offering shelter, services, and a path to permanent supportive housing, a much needed and often talked about need. 
And thankfully, many of the people that we've outreached to have accepted our services and are on their way in their journey to independence. And I'm proud to have been a part of changing those lives. But these victories are often overshadowed by our greatest obstacle, those homeless individuals suffering from mental health challenges that are made worse by living on the street. Because it is hard to get healthy, it is hard to get sober, it is hard to become whole when you are living on the streets. In Anaheim, we are able to dispatch mental health clinicians, crisis intervention specialists as part of our interactive programs. And we do try to lead with compassion as we recognize that letting people suffer with mental illness on the street is simply inhumane. And at this stage, and in partnership with the state of California, we must embark on the next phase of addressing homelessness. We commend California for taking a bold step forward with the CARE Act and the help that it's going to bring our residents in need. But we must work together to update our approach for handling these most challenging cases. We need to broaden our definition of someone who needs intervention to ensure that they get the help as soon as possible. And we must couple that with real-time insight on the availability of psychiatric, crisis, and drug treatment beds to get people where they need to be. Senator Eggman's bills will do just that. And I am proud, as the representative from Anaheim, to support that legislation, and I thank you for your leadership on these important issues. In Anaheim, we stand ready to implement these changes in continued partnership with the state. Thank you very much. I'd like to call, please, Senator Scott Wiener. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. First of all, I just want to, from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank uh, my colleague, Senator Eggman, uh, for leading here. She and I uh, uh, facilitate our mental, Senate Mental Health Caucus together, uh, and it is amazing uh, to work with her. She is fierce. Uh, she doesn't take no for an answer, and she's going to get the job done. And it's my uh, honor to be her wingman on uh, this critically important uh, effort. You know, we, we know that the fundamental solution to homelessness is housing. Uh, despite what some uh, say, the fundamental solution to homelessness is housing. We know that most homeless people do not have mental health or addiction problems. They're bringing their kids to school. They're going to work but they may be waking up in a car or a shelter or couch surfing. But we know that there are homeless people who do need mental health support and support with their addiction. And there is a small percentage of people living on our streets who are so severely debilitated that they are not capable of making decisions for themselves. We can't just plop them in a home and expect them to, to succeed. They need housing, but they need additional support so that they can thrive and so that they don't die. And right now, the system that we have in place is allowing people to deteriorate and fall apart and ultimately die on our streets. And it is, despite what some advocates say, it is not progressive to just sit by uh, and let people deteriorate, fall apart, and ultimately die on our streets. That is the opposite of progressive. Uh, and so this effort is not about some sort of mass institutionalization, like some people would say in a very alarmist way. This is about a very focused and targeted effort uh, to take the folks who are dying on our streets, the people who are, you know, people come up to me in San Francisco when they say that that, that woman, every day I see her standing in the middle of the streets screaming at cars. Why is no one doing anything about it? Or that Man, I see him every day sleeping in his own excrement. Why is no one doing anything about it? Because the laws are broken. And we have an opportunity to fix those laws for these human beings. That's always, it's so easy in modern society to become numb. And we see this devastation on our streets uh, and we just, people just ignore it. You screen it out because it's too painful to acknowledge that that, that is someone's son or daughter that that is someone's husband or wife, that that's someone's mother, that that's someone's best friend. It's too painful for people to even process what that means, and we have to always remember and process that 
and react by working to save their lives. Um, there are people, um, because of some the avalanche of press coverage about Britney Spears, who think it's easy to conserve people in California. The exact opposite is true. I know someone in Los Angeles whose mother was suffering from severe dementia. He needed to conserve her. He could not get a conservatorship for his mother in California and had to go out of state to get a conservatorship. That's the actual state of conservatorship law in California. And we need to have a better system, and that's what this legislation uh, will help us do. Um, I also just want to make a plug, um, as, as chair of our Mental Health Caucus, that the, the actual ultimate goal is not to have conservatorships and to actually help people before they are debilitated and dying, to get people, and particularly young people, to get them help and mental health support when they're first starting to exhibit mental health symptoms, when they're first starting to have substance use problems. What we've created in this in California and in this country is a system where, where we don't intervene early. We make it impossible, even if you have insurance, to get mental health treatment. And then we help you once you're in crisis. How about we start helping people before they're in crisis? Uh, and so I know we're going to do a lot of great work this year in the conservatorship realm and around mental health generally. And again, Senator Eggman, and, and I want to thank my own mayor, Mayor Breed, who has been just a staunch, consistent supporter uh, of this effort from even before uh, she was mayor. So thank you. And I now want to uh, bring up, uh, this is again a bicameral, bipartisan effort, um, Assemblymember uh, James Gallagher. All right, good morning, and thank you uh, for being here today. I, I also want to start by thanking my colleague, Senator Eggman, um, who I've been able to stand together with on several issues since we've been in the legislature. Um, but this has been a, a big one for us um, that we, we both recognize, and this is a very bipartisan effort, that policy needs to change here. And there's been a lot of great things said um, by the previous speakers, um, but I think you can really summarize it. And, you know, this is, there is no silver bullet. Uh, to solving this issue. It is a multi-pronged uh, approach. You know, we do need to remove stigma from mental health. We need more mental health professionals uh, that can help serve people, uh, you know, throughout our state. Um, you know, Care Court, you know, I think is a good step in the right direction. But I think the key fundamental principle of what we're talking about today is that without policy change, without statutory law change, you cannot solve the problem. Uh, and we see this in countless communities throughout the state. Every city is experiencing this, that we have this cycle of devastation, of human devastation on the streets, of people who we all know need help and literally cannot get it because of the current law. It needs to change, and that is why we are pursuing this. That's why we've been doing this for several years, and I think this year is going to be the year. Um, and it is true, as was said, that you know Senator Eggman, when she is on something, she is relentless. Uh, and that's why I love working with her, because I'm the same way, um, is that we need to get this done this year. Um, you know, there's been a lot of different things being said about this um, that are really inaccurate and they're not true. Uh, this is about heeding the calls of families, countless families across the state who are trying to help their loved ones um, and people who are out on the street and who literally, you know, are a danger to themselves and others. Um, and if we can solve this problem, if we can actually stop getting these people in a cycle of going to jail where the, the sheriffs will tell you they don't have the capability um, and the right resources to help people, or going to a hospital where they will tell you that them taking up a bed for 72 hours and not having the resources to help those people, only to release them back out um, and start the cycle all over again. That has to stop, and the way it stops is by making this fundamental policy change. Um, and also, you know, I think the, uh, the bed registry is also very important. I said multi-pronged approach. Going back to when I was a county supervisor, we saw this. You know, trying to find room in a puff or a, or a mental health facility was very difficult. Um, so somehow having a way to, you know, a streamline, a database that people can connect to right away is certainly going to be very helpful as well. Um, so this is a multi-pronged approach. It's a bipartisan approach, and I really think with the coalition that we've, that we've built, 
we can do it this year uh, to make this fundamental policy change and with all of these multiple prongs uh, really see some, some greater success on this issue and ultimately to see people get healed um, and to get back into a productive lifestyle. Um, and so that is, that's our goal and I'm excited to work with this group on this legislation this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we're going to bring up um, Dr. Emily Wood. Hi, I'm um, Emily Wood. I'm representing the California State Association of Psychiatrists. And we are um, very proud to co-sponsor Senator Eggman's um, mental health package this year. Um, we've been lucky to work with her in previous years and are really looking forward to getting some things done uh, this year. Um, we know that appropriate reform of state law is is vital to improving the lives of the the mentally ill patients who we treat, and um, and really it's vital to improve the lives of their families and their loved ones. This is what we need. Um, as physicians and behavioral healthcare providers, it's essential that we respect all the rights of our patients, including the right to receive care from us, and we. Um, we really stand with, um, you know, people like Teresa in, in recognizing that when we're in the position where we cannot keep a person hospitalized to care for them, when their families are begging us to not let them back out on the street, we're, we're on the side of that patient. We do not want to bring anyone into the hospital who doesn't need to be hospitalized. But when that time comes and we cannot protect them, it is devastating for us as providers. It is, this is part of what it means to have physician burnout, these sorts of problems. And we want to be able to work with our patients and their families to keep them safe. A lot has changed since 1967. Um, we know a lot more about the brain. We know a lot, we have a lot more medications. We have a lot more other ways that we support people with mental illness. Uh, the DSM, which uh, is one of the ways we define um, psychiatric disorders, has changed multiple times since then. And really, the law is very outdated. Um, we really need to recognize that um, we continue to stigmatize mental health. And even within mental health, we continue to stigmatize um, substance use disorders. And that's part of what SB uh, 43 is, is going to help us with, is understand that, that all of these brain disorders are something that we can, we can help with. Um, I think it's really critical to recognize that um, while the people on our streets, the ill people on our streets are, are um, people we can see, there are thousands of ill people languishing in our jails who should not be there, who should be getting mental health support, who are not getting any currently. And we should be ashamed, frankly, of, of, of that fact in California. Um, and so, you know, I, I've been talking to street psychiatrists in Los Angeles. I've been talking to um, alternatives to incarceration, diversion folks. I've been talking to um, alternative crisis response folks, people who are going to work on 988 and bringing that out. And everyone agrees that we need some things to change, and part of it is LPS law. I really like what um, Senator Weiner brought to the fore also is that this has to come with the resources to treat patients. Um, that, is, that is what we'll, we'll need. Once we have people and we can keep them to treat them, we need the resources to be there. We need Medi-Cal to actually pay for um, all of the disorders that, that people need to be hospitalized for. Um, so these are things that are, are going to have to keep coming down the road. with. Um, but. This year, we're going to do this with Senator Eggman, and um, we're really excited about it. Thanks. And then our, our uh, final speaker is uh, Dr. Colin Shumate, uh, uh, also from the Psychiatric Physicians Alliance of California. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Colin Shumate, and I'm a psychiatrist in my final year of training at excuse me, UC Davis. I am proudly representing the Psychiatric Physicians Alliance of California, another statewide association of psychiatrists. Um, many people here know the great work of uh, Randall Hager, our lobbyist, and others um, as part of the effort. But it's honestly a little nerve-wracking to follow uh, all these advocates and mayors and legislators, so uh, thank you for having me here today. 
I want to thank you all for supporting this bill and uh, working on other important issues like mental health parity. Uh, thank you for Senate Bill 855 the other uh, two years ago. Um, thank you for working on expanding housing and other important needs for this population. But today, you've heard many perspectives of how important this bill really is for mental health. Um, as a psychiatrist, I've really seen how mental health affects the people of our state and the consequences of serious mental illness that is left untreated. Um, yesterday morning, I was working in the Sacramento County Jail and I was treating patients who were not only arrested sometimes due to things they committed um, during untreated mental illness, but then they also were on a 5150 because they were so ill they couldn't even take care of themselves in the general population of the jail. Uh, so I want to thank my supervisor for covering me for me today so I can actually be here. And uh, I want you all to know that I really know, uh, I see every day what is happening here. Um, the current system um, is not helping patients adequately who have serious mental illness and due to that serious mental illness lack insight into what's really going on in their lives and how their untreated mental illness is really destroying their lives. Uh, the system allows them to refuse care even when they're clearly unable to take care of themselves, even though their untreated mental illness is causing them to be homeless or end up in jail, or even though their untreated mental illness might cause them to die 10 to 20 years prematurely. Senate Bill 43 would address some major issues with our current laws, which unfortunately allow people to fall through the cracks of our safety net in California. The current law is interpreted differently depending on where you live and who's making the decision. Right now, a person might be released to themselves with a bare minimum plan uh, and resources, like such as a plan to sleep in a dumpster and to get food from that dumpster, even where, if that's where they came from and even if there's a, a strong possibility they might freeze to death that night. Uh, this is incredibly inhumane, incredibly, and we have to do so much better. Um, this bill helps with that by making it clear that the status quo is really unacceptable. Um, this bill also helps us treat patients who, due to their uh, mental illness, are neglecting important medical care, even if it might be life-saving. Many of you heard the tragic story of Mark Rippey. Um, his family has been advocating for him for years. He was a blind man with schizophrenia who lacked insight into how serious his illness really was. Um, he was homeless and he could not take care of himself or his needs. Uh, but he did not qualify for involuntary treatment under our current laws. His family begged and begged for years to the doctors and the police and so many others to get him help, but the system got in their way. And unfortunately, after many years of suffering, he passed away last year uh, due to an infection that might have been treatable if his mental illness was taken care of. There's countless stories like this um, and of families who are uh, desperately trying to get their loved ones into care. Uh, so thank you to the families, thank you to NAMI, uh, who are advocating for fixing the system. The, these tragic stories do not have to keep happening, um, and we have to do so much better. It's, as a psychiatrist, it's outrageous this continues to happen and that people with mental illness are suffering so extremely, uh, but that the law so severely limits the help that I can provide when I'm trying to treat my patients. This bill goes a long way to help psychiatrists focus on providing treatment and to meet the needs of our communities. Um, I think this bill will save and improve the lives of many Californians. Um, so thank you, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Senator Eggman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to this fantastic coalition and your profound words, and thank you again for everybody who showed up today with interest in this, um, this topic. Uh, and again, we are not doing this in a vacuum. Over the last few years, we have pumped billions of dollars into our mental health system to be able to work on issues just like this. Last year we did care court. We've pumped millions into workforce development. And as, um, um, as Dr. Wood said, we face huge burnout in our mental health providers because they feel so frustrated so often helping the same person over and over again only to find their help just devolve on the streets one more time. Um, so as we bring in online CalAIM, as we're applying for a waiver to be able to treat our full continuum of care, as we're standing up a, a whole platform for uh, for young kids to be able to receive help. This is another piece that we have to be able to address. Um, 
in honor of people like my Aunt Barbara, who died after being brutally raped on the streets of San Francisco when she was delusional after her children had taken her yet another time uh, to be held against her will uh, and ended up dying in the late 80s of uh, HIV AIDS from that brutal attack. Uh, we know that the most ill of us who, who don't have the insight into their, which is a, which is a part of mental health issues, um, that people don't have insight that they're even sick. Uh, that we know that they deserve care, as people said. They are somebody's sister. They are somebody's mother. Somebody has been advocating for decades to get folks help. Uh, this year, hopefully, we're going to be able to finish that promise and being able to not just turn our backs on those that we see, because as Senator Weiner said, it's so hard to look at. It's so hard to explain to our children why we can't do better. This is the year that we are going to do better. So I thank you all very much for being here, and we're open for your questions. Last year as well. I'm wondering, have you made any significant changes to any of these bills, and what is different about this year that makes you think that you're going to be more successful than you were last year? Um, yes, we have. I mean, we, we've actually expanded it a little bit more to be able to really taking from all the professionals the things that actually needed to be addressed, like like lack of insight, like lack of a plan, like and if it, it can be a mental health diagnosis or a substance abuse diagnosis, because we know the end result uh, looks very much the same. And as Dr. Wood said, they're all it was part of the DSM, which is how we what we use to diagnose. Um, so we've taken input from everybody, and we've actually expanded it a little bit, uh, not just to say that you're going to deteriorate uh, physically, but in all kinds of ways of deterioration. Um, there have been some changes in the other house uh, that we think uh, is going to be more helpful for this bill to be able to go forward. Last year, as you remember, last year we got all the way to the very end with very with two no votes, I think, in the entire 120-body legislature, and we weren't able to get a hearing in, in the in the committee. Uh, this year we feel very uh, optimistic that we'll be able to get all the way to the end. Um, and we've had good talks with the administration about signing the bill when it reaches their desk. So just to, uh, I'm sorry, just to follow up on that, um, you know, it was, it was really concerns from like civil liberties type groups that prevented these bills from being heard in the Assembly Judiciary Committee. Um, are any of the changes you made, do any of those address those concerns um, that, that sort of stalled those bills last year? We're always happy to have conversations with people. I think you, you might have noticed the editorial in the SACB just over this last weekend as they were railing against the care court. Um, and I, you know, we agree with them on a lot of issues and we disagree on a lot of issues. And I always find it interesting that they're arguing for people's rights and I also authored uh, the end of life options care. And they were also very opposed to that, which we know has now been law for quite a few years. So uh, sometimes we can agree to disagree with some of our friends. Disability Rights California, which has filed a lawsuit to block the care court, um, is federally funded. There are some who criticize that they're not representing a good portion of their clientele. Uh, they also have a seat on the uh, Care Care Act working group, whereas family members do not. Uh, do you have any comment on any of, any of that? Um, I think that's I think it's very interesting and something that we can continue to look at. I think family members need to have a, a bigger voice when we're talking about this, not a smaller. And anytime you have a national group at a, a statewide level, I think that that bears um, consideration. I know last year the big part of the debate around the care court uh, legislation was this notion of involuntary treatment. So what what would this bill do that the care court does not? The care court is. Uh, the, the care court is, is voluntary. Um, these bills that we're talking about in specific, is, especially uh, SB 43, is, is talking about treating somebody against their will, if need be. And again, we're talking about people with severe diagnoses that have often been 5150, who will end up in our prisons. And I think it also bears noting that our state hospital systems are full of people who are incapable of standing trial because they are so ill, they have no insight into what kind of crimes they committed. And those are the kinds of things that people end up being treated involuntary or not being treated. So, yes, th so this will actually say that people can be treated against their will. It, it, does it expand that definition? It expands the definition of gravely disabled. Can I, can I clarify that? Yes. This bill in particular talks about detainment. So we actually have separate bills that are for treatment, so for, for instance, medicating someone against right. their will. Right. So I just think that that is an important part of this. So we're Thank actually you. talking about detaining individuals to keep them safe, 
and then providing them with care. Um, but it is a separate thing, and we're actually not touching that part at all with these bills. So I think yes. that's Thank critical. You. Thank you for that clarification. And, uh, and as Dr. Wood said earlier, we have so many more treatments than we had available to us in 1967. Father, can you, do you have any data on how many people this would affect? It's um, a very small number, but yeah. Yeah, we, I, don't think, I don't think we know specifically. I think we're going to ask any of the mayors, like how many people are, are there, they're treating. But these frequent flyers, and last year we passed um, SB 929 that will really looked at, said we have to be, do a much better job of being able to see who, you know, who's being 5150, where do they end up afterwards, what are the outcomes, because we really have no good data stream for that before. We will going forward and we'll have a better idea. Um, so I don't know that we know an exact number. But again, these are people who already exist in our communities. These aren't some new people that we're bringing in from someplace else. These are people who are in dire need of care right now in our communities. Um, can you also discuss, uh, my coworker covered the case of Mark Griffey. Can you talk, he had a traumatic brain injury, like the person Mayor Breed was talking about. Can you talk about how this would change options for his family members like his? Yeah, and I, I, I went out with Mark Rippey's family and, uh, on the streets and, and met with him and talked with him, and he was actively delusional. He was actively delusional and had no insight into the fact that he was, you know, on, on a street and, and somebody had, again, stolen his things that his family had brought him just a, a few days ago. This would provide the, the opportunity for his family to be able to detain him. Um, so it would it would have hopefully provided him an avenue of treatment that was not available because he didn't meet the criteria at that time. People would bring him some food, um, but if you talk with his family, I mean, again, for those who say it's progressive to leave people out there, his checks were being stolen every single month. His his um, he ended up dying of, a, of an infection that would have easily been treated if somebody had the insight to be able to get help that they needed, and he ended up dying despite having a family who loved him and did everything they could to provide care for him, but he became too dangerous to keep him at home, and so he had to go to the streets and then per try to provide care for him there. And the, was the reason he not eligible was because of what Mayor Gloria was talking about? He wasn't a danger to himself? Yep, he wasn't a danger to himself or others. He was quietly living on the streets. Not always quietly. He was arrested multiple times as well, but then not found sick enough to be able to hold detained longer than a 72-hour hold, which, again, we hear people go into the hospital, they take up a bed, they go right back out. And so, again, we looked at exact studies, but that leading to, to a mental health professional's burnout. Senator, can you further clarify the, inter the intersection between Care Corps and this law? So if the definition of critically disabled is expanded, would that give families the option to sort of choose between the different pathways, or how, how would those systems interact with each other? Um, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question, and I think we, we continue to give it more thought because one of the things that we said when we were doing care court, like it is not, you cannot hold somebody against their will, mm -hmm. right? This would be, and again, and, and this, there would be no ref, uh, referral, I don't think, from a care court to a, a conservatorship process, but if somebody goes back on the street and continues in their same kind of behavior, that could happen. And potentially, somebody could be brought in through this process earlier, but again, as everybody has said, the point is not to detain people against their will. The, the point is to get people help much earlier on. And this will hopefully just deal with a, a smaller subset of the population who struggles with mental health issues. There are many people, as has mentioned here today, who are languishing in jail, uh, you know, incompetent to stand trial, and they, um, there's nowhere for them to go mm -hmm. because of the lack of housing. The state hospital system is considerably smaller than it used to be. I covered it as a reporter for the mm -hmm. Sacramento Bee. It was, they were terrible places. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have now is a result of a lack of community care. Yes. So how, how do you deal with the, the jail population and making sure that they get, get treatment? The help that they and need. The yeah, one of the things we're also very pleased with that the administration, the, the Newsom administration, uh, also applied for a waiver to be able to, to work on um, criminal justice. So it's going to be 90 days before somebody gets out of jail that, that services will be able to be to start and have Medi-Cal reimbursement. So that we think is going to be uh, a huge advantage. And as you know, with CalAIM and some of the other programs coming online, Medi-Cal will be able to provide um, payment for housing. Do we still need more housing? Of course we do. 
Of course we do. We're always going to continue to need more beds, hopefully until the time comes that we have done such good work that the number of beds, because we won't let people deteriorate to the point where sometimes there's no return from the de deterioration that we see both physically and mentally. Um, but hopefully that, that, that need will get short, smaller, but we know there's always going to be those folks who are going to need to live in some kind of supported housing, and we'll can have to continue to invest in those. Is there a need to expand the state hospital? Well, I, I don't think that's a topic for today's conversation, um, but certainly I, I had a colleague in my office yesterday talking about that very thing. Madam Senator and Dr. Wood, just a quick uh, clarification. The word detainment, uh, we're talking about detaining to, to treatment facilities? In, a, in an LPS designated facility. To a what? An, an LPS. An LPS designated facility. Yeah, so any of the 5150. Sorry. It, it, we mean in an LPS designated facility. So that is, those have to be um, designated by counties, and they have, uh, they are treatment facilities staffed by uh, mental health professionals. So they are right, not not a jail facility, um, but LPS facilities. That's what we mean. Fantastic, thank you. By the way, I, I'm no entertainment reporter. I can't tell you all the ins and outs of what they they talked about Britney Spears earlier. To be clear about the Britney Spears thing, um, that uh, Senator. Yeah, she was probate conserved. Okay. She was she was probate conserved. She was not LPS conserved. Um, it was a, actually an entirely different set of bills, um, and so that often the a psychiatrist get a little annoyed about that. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. Um, um, yeah, um, but um, and additionally, I think what what Senator Weiner said is absolutely true. We still. Probate and LPS, it is very hard to conserve family members, which, by the way, is what we want. We want there to be a back and forth, you know, between us and people representing the, the rights of our patients. That's important. That's an important part of the process that we have all of that in, in this um, in this network. But um, as it currently stands, it's very easy for, uh, for a person to say, well, I as, as was mentioned, like I could live in that box and get some food out of the dumpster and I have some clothes on me. So I have a plan um, and whether or not they even do that plan currently doesn't matter. Like even, mm -hmm. like even accomplish that doesn't matter. And we need to be able to look sort of at their past and whether or not that's a good plan and we need to have more options for them. And is the detainment just like indefinite in terms of how long it is? And then in terms of the, the you mentioned the medicine, is it different? Can you kind of just clarify that? A 5150 hold is a 72 hour hold. Mm -hmm. To um, be able to hold someone longer, you have to put them on a um, 5250, which is a 14 day hold, and that always requires that there be a, um, a hearing, uh, a probable cause hearing, um, where we discuss with someone um, from the court, and, and, who, and then the patient has someone advocating for them and their desire, if, if it is, to leave the hospital at that point. Um, and then there's a whole set of uh, 53 it, things that go on to um, the process of going towards conservatorship. But but we're talking about very, very time-limited detainment periods here. Um, the part of the law that allows us to uh, medicate someone against their will is um, is done through a Reese hearing, and that also involves a, um, a, a, a talking to uh, people from the court about what the pros and cons would, that would be for this patient and listening to the patient about whether or not that would that's something they, they want. And so that's actually a separate thing that is related, but not the same. So just to be clear, so this, what you're talking about, Senator, everyone, so you're talking about conservatorship, which, I mean, ultimately would allow family members or a conservator to like make decisions about medication and detainment. But can you kind of explain that a little bit? So the... So, and, and the doctor's probably better uh, equipped to, to answer this than me, but this is not, we're not anticipating that people or family members are going to be bringing people to be conserved. That is not the process. And again, as the doctor said, you have to go through the 5150 and then the 5250. And there's a, there's a whole process involved. Um, there are public guardians, and in, in, especially in some of our larger cities, that can take on that role. Uh, and sometimes it's a family, sometimes it's somebody else designated by the, the county. Um, and, but then the Reese hearing still exists. Right. And the, the, the main thing is that we're looking at the definition of gravely disabled. Right. That's the thing, and that applies to all of the different ways that we can um, um, hold someone or put them on a conservatorship, is how we determine that they um, are, are gravely disabled. And so that's what this is getting at, and that will have an effect on all of, therefore, on all of the different um, parts of LPS law. So we can do one last question, because then we have to give up the room. Yeah. 
So just to clarify, there will just essentially be more people possibly eligible to go through this pre-established process. Correct. Okay. With, with different criteria, not just okay. the ability to provide food, clothing, okay. and shelter, or being endangered yourself or others, but that your 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 you continue to deteriorate to a point where you can't provide care for yourself. So historically, people go in fifty one fifty, and then they're released right back with the same the same conditions, but not found um, to meet the criteria. So this expands the criteria in a way that we think will be able to help more people so we have fewer that are just deteriorating in, in ways that are sometimes unrecoverable from. And just really quickly, I know you just introduced it, but do you know when it would take effect if it makes it through? Uh, any bill will take effect next year, the, the year, the January after signature. Got it. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.